It's been a good time to be invested in the market. Since we last spoke, we've seen strength in equity markets, we've seen strength in the fixed income or bond market, and it really has been a good time for portfolios generally, um, going into the latter part of last year. Since we last spoke, we've seen real strength, a rally in the equity markets. And we're going to focus primarily on the US market or the S&P 500, but that's only really for a couple of reasons, partly because it's an area that we favour for portfolios. We are global investors, so as a natural result of that, we will find a relatively high weighting in the US generally, but it is an area that we favoured over the last year or so. But it's also because there's been some interesting developments in that market. So you may recall at the last update, I talked about something called the Magnificent Seven. Now this is the seven largest stocks in the US, in the market that have so much importance. Now, when I spoke last time, I was talking about the rally we saw on the back partly of artificial intelligence. Now, Louis, talk to us. Why is the Magnificent Seven so important and what's been going on since we last spoke? Yeah, no, definitely. So th thanks, Tom. So when we're looking at the US market, it's important just to get really under the bonnet of what it actually is to understand the drivers. So here we've got the 500 largest companies within the US. But what's important to highlight is that these, this index is market cap weighted. What does that mean? So really we're looking at the larger a company is, the bigger its weighting in the index, and the greater its overall influence on the S&P's return. So when we're talking about the Magnificent Seven, these are some of the largest companies within the US. Household names, the likes of Apple, Microsoft, Google, we all know them very well, but they've been so successful and now make up such a large component on the S&P 500, they can direct the returns of the broader index. So these stocks count for around about 30% of the broader S&P 500, so huge proportion, and, and they're able to steer the direction of the broader index. And that's exactly what we saw last year. So with the Magnificent Seven, huge investments in AI, and last year was all about AI. So these companies are very well positioned to benefit from that. What we saw from these stocks were up around 80% together. And like I mentioned, because they take up such a large proportion of the S&P 500, they're able to pull up the broader index. What's interesting though, if you take away the impact of their weight, and instead weight all stocks the same, the return of that index would have been around 2%. So huge differences between the two. Since then, we've seen a far more broad-based rally. Mm -hmm. So here we've seen the Magnificent Seven do very well, but also the other 493 stocks perform well. And that's exactly what we want to see. We like to see a broad-based rally because it shows broad-based confidence in the index. And that's exactly it, isn't it? There, there's been that sort of transitional change since the back end of last year where we've seen a much more broad-based rally in strength in mm. markets. But it's not just been about equity markets. Also, the bond or fixed income market, as I said at the very start, has done really well over that period. Now, I'm showing you a chart here that looks like it's going down, but that's about yields. Because don't forget, there's an inverse relationship. Values go up, yields go down. Values go down, yields go up. So what we've seen is a rally in the bond market, seeing values rise as yields fall, as the market has started to price in possibly lower interest rates. And that's been the key story of the last, I would say three or four months, but actually probably the last year or so. It's all been about inflation and it's all been about base rates. Now, not to go back over this because we've talked about inflation a lot, but inflation has been high and it's come down. Now what the um, markets are trying to understand is at what point do central banks pivot? In other words, at what point do they start thinking about cutting rates? Now, Cutting rates or going to a lower interest rate environment can be really good for growth, but it can also stimulate inflation. So central banks are trying to walk that fine line between getting inflation under control, but also not killing off growth. In other words, once they start to cut rates, that will stimulate growth and keep, in, keep the economies going and stop them from sliding into recession. Now, so far, they've done a pretty good job. They have, and it's a fine balance, isn't it? 
It's it, as art as much as it is a science. But inflation really does matter because it can influence market direction, or at least what markets are expecting central banks to do. No, it can. And the market has got so fixated on rate cuts over the next few months or so. And what's interesting, we look back to Q3 last year, the market was really expecting the amount of rate cuts to be less. And you saw a strong correlation with the broader S&P 500, around about a 10% fall in returns. What's happened since then, though, is the number of rate cuts being priced in has increased. And with that, we've seen a broad-based rally in the S&P, up around another 17%. So big swings in the market, largely influenced by the market's expectation of the direction of travel on, on rates, how fast, how quickly they're going to move downwards. And that's been driving the bond market as well. No, definitely. And I think what's interesting for us is as much as, yes, rates are important, but ultimately we know the direction of travel. Mm. It doesn't matter when these cuts occur to a certain extent because the Fed have already told us that rates are too high, rates are restrictive, because their ultimate long-term target is 2.5%. At 5.5%, that's very restrictive territory. So we don't know when the rate cuts are going to occur. We don't know how quickly we're going to move to that 2.5% level. But ultimately, it doesn't really matter because what we're focused on is how the current rate environment is impacting the broader economy. Economic activity, are we getting inflation under control? And it feels like we are. So it's creating the right platform for growth going forward. So some really positive news there. But I think it's worth just revisiting why we own equities or indeed bonds and credit. We think of equities as being probably the most volatile within your portfolios. It tends to, what do we mean by volatility? It's really just the risk, the movement, the swings in price that we see. And there are times, particularly over the short term, when you can see a lot of movement. And it can be quite uncomfortable as an investor, certainly as an asset owner. But it's a love-hate relationship at times. You need the volatility, you need the risk, because you want to be rewarded. We want equities in our portfolios so that you can get the return. And the return is a product of the risk that you take. So they have to exist together. But there are times when it can feel uncomfortable, which is what we've seen recently, because there's quite a lot of volatility in the market. Now, our job is to try to navigate the portfolios, to interpret the environment that we're in, to make sure that they're positioned correctly in the right areas, in the right asset classes, and in the right mix, to make sure that we can navigate through that path, and as Simon was saying earlier, to be able to focus on the bigger picture. You're totally right, and like you say, it felt like a particularly volatile period the last six months or so, but when you take a step back, you can see it's just a blip on the map. So it's about trying to be comfortable with that volatility, even starting to love it, if you can, and being comfortable with the fact that you'll be able to generate long-term premiums on the back of being invested for the long term. Now, just to leave you with a few thoughts, Gemma, I think in general, we're starting to move really quite cautiously optimistic on markets. Central banks seem to have done a good job in terms of managing that fine balance between managing inflation and without killing off economic growth. So we, we feel like we're in a starting to move into a more positive environment. There's a lot of activity on the political side. You know, we've just recently had the, uh, the, the budget. We've got activity going on with the Fed and the, and the debt ceiling. There's a lot on the geopolitical side, but there always is. There's always something to be able to interpret and navigate. Thinking about the bigger picture is really important. And we are starting to move cautiously optimistic. And maybe, as Louis says, just learning to love volatility just that little bit.